This year, the 6th and 7th graders have been learning about marine biology since the beginning of the year. We mostly learned about St. Andrews Bay and what lives in it. In a final representation of what we have learned, we have put together our knowledge and research into this website about how, about how to help nourish St. Andrews Bay. For our website, each of the students studied specific animals or plants and uh, wrote about it in the website. A few of the 6th and 7th graders also learned about the problems in the bay and the solutions of how to fix them because we want everyone to enjoy the bay for, for hundreds of years. Next, Addy will present on the head quizzy. most endangered sea turtle. Its nesting population estimates at just 12,000 individuals. There are many reasons this sea turtle is endangered. Some of the reasons are habitat loss, people eating their eggs, human buildings, pollution, and offshore lighting. These are the causes of them being endangered. But how can we help? We can help by doing things like not polluting, and not flashing lights on the beach. We should also turn off outside condo lights because sea turtles may think it's moonlight and get attracted. Now Jenna will speak to you about the loggerhead sea turtle. Sound. They 
right hand, Selma will be presenting Flounder. Flounders eat many things like small fish, shrimp, and crabs. Predators consist of large fish, sharks, and eels. The color of the body depends on the habitat and is usually brown with red, orange, green, and blue markings. markings. As you can see, they can camouflage very well. Did you know that they can camouflage between two to eight seconds? A female that is 14 inches can release up to 460,000 eggs, and a 27 inch female can release up to 4,200,000 eggs in the water at the same time. Flounders are flat with both eyes on the same side of their, on their head. They can live up to three to 10 years. They're usually found beneath the sand to hide from predators or to snack their prey. And their origin is from the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. I did my project on fiddler crabs. Did you know there are over a hundred species of fiddler crabs in the world, but only four live in St. Andrew's State Park? They're about two inches long, and they turn dark in the day and light at the night. They eat by licking the tribes out of the sand. Also, when they're getting threatened by a predator, they dig two feet underground and then get a sand ball over the burrow so no predator can see them. The males have a large claw so that they can scare away predators and attract females. Um, a male marsh fiddler crab has a blue royal spot on their carpet. A carpet is the back of the fiddler crab, the shell. Their scientific name is yucca. For my presentation, I did blue crabs. Blue crabs eat anything that has meat in it, such as the fiddler crabs. They live in brackish lagoon estuaries. They grow up to four to nine inches long. They live up to three years. They're very sensitive to environmental changes, such as global warming and habitat loss. There, there are four species of blue crabs. It's named the blue crab because of its sapphire-tinted claws. The scientific name of the blue crab is Calamanthus sapidus which means savory, beautiful, or otherwise known as tasty and good looking. <laughs> <laughs> There's a common parasite that can latch on a blue crabs and they look like eggs, so they make a male or female think they're pregnant. <laughs> and, that, and the parasite is called saculina. to 1,100 pounds, or 500 kilograms. Um, when you're visiting or seeing um, the bottomless dolphin, you should stay, you can stay up for 30 minutes, but you should not stay for any longer because they tend to get bored easily. They usually swim in groups of two to 15. Males usually weigh long, way more than the female and are usually longer. The reason this is is because when fighting for females, usually they want to be bigger, just like lions. Um, they have no hair, and their skin is very rubbery and smooth. They usually live in tropical waters where the water is, well, where surface waters vary from 50 degrees Fahrenheit to 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, 
One side of the bottomless dolphin's brain must always be active, meaning they can never fully sleep. Since they are mammals, they also breathe air just like us, meaning that they always have to go up for air. The reason their skin is so rubbery is because they always jump out of the water, but they have to stay underwater so that their skin does not dry out. Next, Lacey will be presenting her information on the dwarf seahorse. Today I'm going to tell you about the dwarf seahorse. The dwarf seahorse is one of the four smallest species found in U.S. waters. It is endangered because in Japan or China they use it for medicine, and then they they can be really hard to find, so they declared it endangered. The major effects are habitat loss, habitat loss, damage to the boat trawls, and global warming. And when a female and a male meet, they do a little dance with, they wrap their tails, they change the colors, and hair head bobbing. Another thing is, oh, and the male, when a female and a male meet, they agree, and then the female gives the eggs to the male and held it in a pouch. <laughs> Next will be Aspen presenting on the sea trout. Good morning. Have you ever tried a sea trout? If you have, you would know that it tastes amazingly delicious. Sea trout, also known as the speckled trout, is a common estuary fish found in the southern United States and near the Gulf of Mexico. Sea trouts are found near mangrove fringe shorelines and seagrass meadows. They are also above oyster bars. Sea trouts are found near the southeastern states in the United States. Small trout eat crustaceans and shrimp. However, once they grow, their diet shifts towards other fish. The oldest sea trout ever found was estimated to be nearly 12 years old. However, this is extremely rare. The average age of a normal sea trout is four to five years old. Now, Raymond will be presenting to you mullet, fish mullet. And today I will be talking to you about the mullet. Did you know that they can weigh up to 10 pounds? Despite this, their average weight is 1 to 3 pounds. They are also approximately 12 to 30 inches long. They are known to feed on things such as detritus. Since Roman times, mullet have been known as key sources of food all over the world. In some countries that are in Europe, the mullet is known as the goatfish. One interesting fact about mullet is that when they are in water with a low oxygen level, they tend to jump out of the water more often in order to obtain more oxygen. Now, the demo will be speaking to you about the harmful effects of stormwater runoff. talking to you about plain communities. First of all, I'm going to be talking about salt marshes. Salt marshes is a coastal wetland that is flooded and drained by salt water flow tile. <clears throat> um, the soil in the salt marshes is composed of deep mud and pit. It's a, one of the main reasons that salt marshes are important is because it's a breeding and spawning area. It also is a composer and a decomposer and a food producer for many animals. The vegetation in the salt marshes is used as a, a hideaway from predators for many animals. It also filters pollutants and access nutrients, so um, not too many nutrients goes into the water and the water becomes brackish. It also filters pollutants, which lessens the pollution amount in the water and also reduces flooding and coastal wetland uh, erosion. 
and the next one I'm to you about seagrass. In the past uh, animals that we talked about, we know that a lot of them live in seagrass. And one thing you gotta be really cautious about is when um, you're boating, you gotta be really careful with seagrass because if you get tangled into the seagrass, you do not want you gotta stop your boat and untangle it or leave a prop scar and it'll endanger many animals. It's also a flowering plant and it grows in marine fully salt line, so you cannot find it in fresh water. It's a home to many species and it's a food producer for many animals like silver perch, dwarf seagull, small and some other uh, animals. The meadow holds the sedimentation down in the water, so not too many, um, so the current of the ocean doesn't move too fast. <clears throat> the roots and the rhizomes, which is this, uh, it stabilizes the seabed, which uh, slows the current down, so not too many things move, and it's a fertilizer for sandy soil. It's also a source of protection from coastal erosion, such as salt marshes, and seagrass has, scientists have found that seagrass has 10% of more carbon storage, which is twice as much as how much rainforest hold. And the meadows benefit, which it also filters pollutants and nutrients, such as salt marshes. And next would be about problems in the bay, and it will be about litter, no, not litter and seagrass, but it's by Jennifer Martin. Or stormwater runoffs by Hamza. Today I will be talking to you about stormwater runoff. Basically, stormwater runoff is rainfall that flows over a surface and then leads to a drain. It, flow, it can flow over roads, driveways, parkways, and rooftops, and many more. Stormwater runoff can carry such things as trash, dog waste, fertilizer, as you can see in this picture. Stormwater runoff is the number one cause of street impairment. When stormwater runoff goes to a drain, it can lead to a stream, lake, river, and then eventually leads to the ocean. And we do not want that water. The impacts of stormwater runoff can be decreased the decreased by increasing the tree canopy over the surface. Basically, um, when there's a lot of runoff, the trees or plants will absorb the water and the excess, excess nutrients, and it won't be as bad. One way you can decrease stormwater runoff is to not put, put the minimum amount of fertilizer on your lawn. You're probably asking, why do you want to do that? Well, if it's about to rain, the, it will carry the fertilizer and go to a drain, and then it eventually leads to the ocean. And really, we do not want that water. <laughs> Thank you. And now, Jenna Tabao will be presenting cigarettes. are easier to use than sewer systems because they dispose household waste on site. However, the only problem with septic systems is that when it comes time to clean them, it is a huge pain. Cleaning septic systems is very hard. 
And now Vivian will present to you on what she found about overfishing. What is overfishing? Basically, it's explained in the name. It's catching too many fish. Overfishing is catching fish faster than they can reproduce. But why is this a problem? Overfishing is a huge problem affecting the bait because it can make any species go extinct or endangered. How can we help? We can help by putting catch limits on when we go fishing. Also, we can make sure that we prevent bycatch or make sure that our bycatch is released safely with the proper fishing rules. Now, you may be wondering, what is bycatch? Bycatch is when you catch the wrong species. We can also make sure that we keep an eye on other people fishing, making sure that they are using the proper fishing tools and making sure they are using the proper fishing tools. Next is do that doing bycatch. Okay, what is bycatch? Bycatch is mostly in the fish industry. Bycatch is when you're fishing for a targeted animal and you accidentally catch an animal that you don't want. Many animals are being endangered and extinct because of this purpose, like the sea turtles. <clears throat> bycatch can cause many problems. It can cause when we left to be extinct and endangered, and it causes many problems. Many, uh, many industries industries cannot solve this problem because they do not have the proper fishing tools. About 50 billion dollars every year uh, costs from mismanagement of fish industries because they do not have the tools to actually save the animals that they are caught accidentally. About 90% of some predatory fish are gone because of bycatch when they are not meant to be caught but they get caught. And less than 2% of the world's ocean is protected, which means only about 2% of the fish industries actually have the tools needed to actually save these animals. This is a really hard problem because um, having the proper tools costs a lot of money, but it would cost more when you're actually catching an animal that is not needed, and then it could become um, extinct, and it will be a problem in the long run. And next will be... Uh, Voting memory. Hello, I'm Miriam, and I'm my presentation is on voting. Um, if the manatee goes up to take effect for a few seconds, it could die immediately because of the impact of the boat hitting the manatee. Seagrass is an important home, but the boaters starve the seagrass, like in this picture right here. Um, cuts that manatees give from propeller get infections in them, causing them to die. Um, be careful putting oil in your boat because it can spill out. The water is is a home to many animals, so the oil damages the water and the animals in it. Also, make sure you drive your boat at a slow speed so you don't hit manatees and other animals. 